Thank you, friends, for joining us at um, all of our sites and those that are joining us online. I'm so eager for you to meet Dr. John Van Epp in just a few moments. Um, I have long admired architects, people who have been given this creative capacity to design and build structures that make life better and more beautiful. And John Van Epp is a relationship architect who's designed and created a structure called the Relationship Attachment Model that makes relationships better and more beautiful. He is the founder of Love Thinks, the author of How to Avoid Falling in Love with a Jerk, the best name of a book I've ever heard, <laughs> as well as Becoming Better. He has um, got all kinds of experience serving as a pastor, serving as a professor in a seminary on the relationship issue of marriage and family studies in that seminary. Also, is a, a critical um, thinker in today's world on relationships, a clinical counselor for 25 years in his private counseling practice. And listen to this, over 20 years, he has trained military personnel and contracted with the military as a subject matter expert in relationship health, psychology, religion, suicide, and resilience. I'm grateful for people who serve our country to that given end, it's, it's a gift. In fact, he's taught over 10,000 certified instructors to over 1 million participants in every branch of the military, churches and communities, um, in settings in 50 states across our union and 11 countries. I mean, this material has just swept across our country. He's featured in Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Psychology Today, has appeared on CBS Early Show, Good Morning America, and I could go on and on. He's been happily married to Shirley, his wife, who is with us today. So great to have you with us, Shirley. And so celebrating uh, your husband because, you know, he's teaching on relationships. So celebrating your husband is just a great thing to do on this day and every day. And, uh, and then for the opportunity just to be at Westwood, this relationship goes back a little ways for us. I, we met two years ago at a conference that I was speaking at in Santa Barbara area of California, beautiful time right before COVID hit. And they were seated at the dinner table where I was seated. Little did I know how God would use that moment. We just connected. So the next day we had lunch with friends and them and uh, we, we just lit up. It was so fun. And they took this model that you're gonna learn about today and they gave it to us at that lunchtime. So we did marriage counseling right there during our lunch, practical strangers. And it was a bit awkward, but really meaningful as we <laughs> learned together about each other, the intentionality of being together. So. I just knew he needed to come to Westwood and uh, it's taken a little while, but he's here now and I want you to give a warm, beautiful Westwood welcome to John Van Epp and Shirley, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Major, major and awkward, that's what I do. <laughs> Don't talk to me, you'll be in trouble. Over the, I mean, I gotta say over the last several months, Joel, it's just been, Phenomenal to work together with you, preparing for this with your staff. You got phenomenal staff, Vicki, Sherry, they run the church, we all know. And um, your kids, men, leadership and the youth, it just goes on and on and on. And it's a real honor to be here with you, to kick off this relationship series and to have you um, use this relationship attachment model as kind of the focus of your series. You know, I, I know relationships can be difficult and challenging, and I wanted to start with kind of a note of optimism and hopefulness, so I chose a title, Winning at Relationships, which kind of begs the question, okay, exactly how do you do that? How do you win at relationships? So when I was preparing, I was looking around, I came across an article uh, written about what we'll call the junior experts, kids ages five to 10, that answered questions about dating, love, and marriage. Winning at marriage, first question. Hey, what's the best age to get married? Judy, age eight, said, the best age to get married is 84 years old. <laughs> she explains, at that age, you don't have to work anymore and you can spend all your time loving each other in the bedroom. <laughs> you didn't know what you had to look forward to, did you? Now, Tommy was a little more optimistic about uh, the timing of marriage. He was five years old. He goes, hey, once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm gonna find me a wife. <laughs> Winning at dating. So uh, what should people do on a date was a question that was asked to Michael, age 10. He said, well, on the first date, just tell each other a bunch of lies. Because that usually gets them interested in going out on a second date. <laughs> 
Kids speak truth, okay? Let's just, let's just face the reality. You know, winning at love. Here's the last uh, kind of set of questions. Why do people fall in love? Well, Jan, age nine, said, you know, nobody really knows why people fall in love, but I've heard that it has something to do with how they smell, <laughs> which is probably why deodorant and perfume are so important. Then Dave, I love what Dave says. He goes, age eight, love always finds you, even when you're trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from love since I was five years old. <laughs> you know, we're all looking for answers to our relationship questions and concerns, but God in his word does give us a very clear formula for how to win at relationships. So this morning, what I'm going to do is kind of two parts. The first part is we're going to look at God's formula for winning at relationships. And then the second half is that we're going to Say, how do we implement that formula in our lives day to day into our relationships? And what we look at in terms of the implementation, we'll use this model to kind of help us with that. We'll foreshadow what you're going to be going through over the next couple months in the relationship series that you'll be doing. So God's formula. Here we go. Very simple. God's formula says God's provision plus your effort equals winning at relationships. You know, the Apostle Paul had a, a very, very personal, in fact, the most personal letter he ever wrote in the New Testament, which was to the Christians at Philippi. And the book of Philippians, as we call it, has only four chapters. But if you read it from beginning to end, every chapter is about relationships because it's the heart of the Apostle Paul. And I believe his heart reflects the heart of God. Relationships are the core of our God that we worship and of his will for our lives. So let me read verses one through four of chapter two in Philippians and just kind of pay attention as I read this that this passage is couched in an if-then kind of grammatical framework. And we think of the word if like hypothetical, but without getting into the technicality, Paul chose a grammatical structure where if is factual. So you could kind of, insert the word since rather than if. So here is the fact that then necessitates or obligates this then outcome. So kind of think about that when I read verses one through four, Philippians chapter two. Therefore, he says, if or since, we could say, you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love and if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then... Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Just stare at this passage for a minute. The if in verse 1 is God's provision, encouragement. Let me underscore them. Comfort. God provides a common sharing of his spirit. God provides tenderness, compassion. These are the experiences God provides in a supernatural way to us. But then verse two, here is your effort. Be like-minded. Practice love. Be one. Don't be selfish or vain. Rather, exercise humility. Look to the interest of others over your own interests. It's as if God says, I will provide a supernatural kind of infusion into your life of my provision, but it needs to be matched by you making intentional effort in your relationships. So I want to take that passage and that formula and kind of extract out of it two relationship realities that are embedded. They're, they're implied in that passage. And the first one is this. Our relationships do not run themselves. I mean, think about what that passage said. You be like-minded. In other words, you put the effort to run your relationships with the provision of God. But the implication is this. That relationship doesn't run itself. Somebody must run it. Somebody must, you know, direct it in a goal-oriented way. Somebody must manage it. And think about it. If a relationship doesn't actually take care of itself, if a relationship doesn't run itself, then it's also not self-correcting. Relationships don't fix themselves. And that's the second relationship reality. They don't run themselves and they don't fix themselves. When a relationship breaks, someone must do something about it. Relationships are not self-healing. 
They must be mended by us. I think we kind of have a misguided belief, you know. It's kind of like this. If a relationship is good, then it runs itself. And for those of you who are married, this is a huge barrier. I mean, you're, you might be just sitting here saying, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, I nod it, got it. But we really believe just the opposite. And the barrier looks like this, you know, hey, there's a, there's a marriage class. And you look at your spouse and be like, D -d -d there's a marriage class, you wanna go? I don't know, do we have any problems? None that I know of. Nah, we don't need it. And then you walk by the class and you're like, those are the people that have problems. Maybe we ought to just go and listen to their problem. That'd be kind of entertaining. So that was a joke. I, and you, you're like, wow, he's stepping on my toes. No, no, no. But do you see the barrier? If our relationship is good and we don't have any, quote, problems, we don't need to invest anything into it. We don't need to make any effort because it just what? Runs itself. And when we look at the scriptures, I submit to you that we see the exact opposite from God's word. We must invest continually in our relationship. Relationships take effort, and we must do that investment, that intentional effort, with the provision of God, but it must happen together. So I'm going to jump down to the conclusion of this passage, which is 12 and 13, verses 12 and 13. But before I do, I just want to mention this passage I'm going to skip from verse 5 all the way through to 11. So we read 1 through 4. We're going to skip 5 through 11. But that 5 through 11 is truly the most magnificent description of the sacrifice and love of Christ in the entire New Testament. You ought to read it closely because basically it says, starting in verse six, that this Jesus who existed as God himself. So it is the statement of the divinity of Jesus. Here he is before he was born in Bethlehem. Here is God. And the second person of the Trinity says, I will step into humanity, but I'm going to lay aside all of my rights as God. Did not consider equality, that, that placement, that position, those entitlements of being God as something to be held onto, but laid them aside, stepped into humanity. Think about that. The creator becoming the creation. And then going one step further to say, I'm not only going to become the very creation that I created, I am also going to take on the form of the lowliest form, which is a servant. And then I will go so far as to give my life in obedience to the point of death. And not just any death, the most humiliating of deaths, the death on a cross. And you say that passage is a phenomenal passage. In the theology terms, we call it Christology, soteriology, salvation, Christ. But I want you to notice something. Those verses are there, not so much to tell us about Jesus, but to tell us about relationships. Because what they are saying is basically this. God never asks us to do anything in our effort in relationships. What we're to do, our part in relationships, God never asks us to do anything there that he himself has not first done. He laid aside what he was entitled to do and to have and how to be treated. He took on the role of someone to serve the needs of others. He went to the point of giving his own life. I mean, how much more could ever be asked of us? So when you think of God's provision and what he provides for us, you also need to recognize that he not only gives you a provision, he gives you a role model. He spearheaded the whole pattern of how we are to exercise effort and intentionality in our relationships. And then you come to verse 12 and 13, which is really that biblical formula in the most succinct but profound summary, I think. Paul says, and I read it to you, verse 12 and 13, therefore, meaning in conclusion, let me wrap this up is what he's saying. You continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, in the English, we see work out, work in, and it looks like the same English words, but in the original language that Paul wrote, he chose two different and very, you know, different meaning words. And I want to do a little word study with you, work out and work in. And we're going to start with work in on verse 13, because it says, God is going to work in you. This is the provision, right? 
And when I tell you what the word that Paul used in the Greek language, is, which is what he wrote in, you're going to recognize it. So I want you to say it in English when I say the Greek word. The Greek word was God energes you, which is the word energy or energizes. What a cool image. God's going to energize you. And look at what he energizes. Look at verse 13. It is God who energizes you, works in you to will. So first of all, What's that? Your, your will, your, your willpower, your desires, your motivation. Now, what, what does that have to do with relationships? Why is God energizing our motivation? Well, it goes like this. Sometimes what you know you should do in your relationships, you just basically don't feel like doing it. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been there? Is it just me? Hey, you know you ought to do this, John, in your marriage. Yeah? So? Don't really feel like it. Well, you ought to do it, right? Or this is something you ought to do in your friendship, yeah? Right? Don't feel like it. Or this is what you ought to do with your kids. Or kids, this is how you ought to do to your parents. Okay, well, thanks. See you later. <laughs> or sometimes we're a little bitter berry, aren't we? This is what you ought to do in your marriage. Yeah, well, you know, I do this, but they don't do it back for me. You know, give me a little and then I'll give back some. Sometimes... We have hardened hearts, don't we? And yet, if you walk with the Lord, you're not worshiping a God that sits on a mountain or in a throne way over there. This is a God that has come to live inside of you and called your body his temple and placed that spirit of God in you who is actually energizing your motivation and willpower. Well, how cool is that? You can pray, Lord, you need to soften my heart because I don't feel like doing what I know I ought to do. And not only that, look at God works in you to energize you to will and to act. The very ability to do it. Now, understand, this is not independent of your effort. God's provision must be done in conjunction or in partnership with our own responsibility and intentionality. Because in verse 12, it begins with, you continue now, this is the imperative mood, which means it's a command. So he's commanding you. You must continue to what? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that word work out is a completely different word. It's not energes. It's a word that is often translated bring to completion. Make it happen. It's the very word that Nike should have used for their slogan, which is Nike's slogan is... Just do it. Or maybe you don't relate to Nike. Maybe you can relate to Larry the Cable Guy, which he says, come on, here, will hear you. Get her done. God's going to, he's going to energize your motivation. He's going to help you to do it. But only when you put your shoulder to the wheel of life and the wheel of relationships. Wait, only when you get her done. You got to step into it to activate the energy of God. So Listen. When I was researching this word, work out, I came across a really interesting use of it in uh, secular writings. It was actually by a man named Strabo who lived about 50 years before Christ. And he was writing, he was a historian, and he was writing about Roman soldiers over in Spain that were working in the mines. And they were literally working out of the earth precious minerals. And it gives us a wonderful imagery of how Paul is saying Work out of your salvation. Dig into your salvation. Mine out of your salvation. God has deposited salvation in you with all of its splendor. You dig in and you mine out of it the practical skills for running your relationships to fulfill your effort. So God will provide energy. He'll provide truth. He'll provide empowerment. But you better dig in and mine out the practical ways to make it happen. And that's where we're going to transition. And it's really where I've lived, uh, honestly, in my career of 40 years. Uh, I call it um, trying to come up with all of the how-tos for God's ought-tos. And particularly in this realm of relationships. How do we do the how-tos for God's ought-tos? So when you look up the word relationship in the dictionary, it simply is translated as a connection. 
So back in the 1980s, and this will date me, but I was working on my doctoral degree and I was just immersed in relationships. We had planted a church. I was now in counseling practice. I was in my academics. And I took both biblical truth and this whole realm of relationship theory and psychosocial kind of research. And I started trying to chunk it all together and say, you know, if a relationship is a connection, can we identify the specific connections? Because that might empower us to better run our relationships. And I began to find that these five areas on their own had a tremendous body of you know, theory and research and biblical truth behind each, each one, but each one was a connection, even between us and God. You know, how I know God is not just enough. I need, I, I need to take what I know and translate it into true belief, into a true well-formed trust in God. And then I need to step out, right? I need to rely, I need to form, a, I need to depend on God. I can't just say that I believe and I trust. I gotta have actions of dependence. I gotta come to terms with the Lordship of Jesus. And I gotta frequently <laughs> come back to that and say, let me surrender all. That song we sung is not just about, you know, back when I first accepted you as my savior, daily I am surrendering. I'm coming to terms with my commitment and if you say, how does touch fit into your relationship with God? But just remember this, the God of all eternity stepped into humanity and brought God into the realm of human touch, right? That was the incarnation. But the resurrection of Jesus took human touch. Remember, he said to his disciples, come touch me, give me something to eat. I still have some kind of physical, you know, characteristics to my body. It's a resurrected, I'm not a ghost. And the God of eternity that stepped into human touch took human touch back into eternity. And our resurrection makes human touch not only part of this life, but somehow part of our relationships to some extent on into eternity and even with God. Is that amazing or what? And these same bonds are not only part of our relationship with God, they're part of our relationship with each other. Let me just give you a quick example of how they're bonding. If we could just isolate one of them, let's isolate no. So I was uh, flying out of Ohio back when my wife and I lived in Ohio a number of years ago. And uh, I grew up in Ohio and we raised our family there and in our 50s, we left Ohio. That shows how much time it takes for us to get smart. So anyway, <laughs> no, I love Ohio, I'm sorry. I just gotta, I gotta you know, it's like slamming your own family, right? You guys gotta tease a little bit. Anyway, I sat down in an airplane as I was flying out of Cleveland, Ohio, and this, uh, this woman, probably in her early 60s, she was like kind of manic, you know, like see somebody all rushing and throwing, she had a lot of packages, and she sits down, and I go, hey, are you, you know, are you going home? It looked like she had been shopping. I don't know why anybody goes to Cleveland, Ohio to go shopping. They ought to come here to the, to the you know, Mall of America and go shopping, right? She goes, no, 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 I'm from St. Louis. That's where we're flying. She goes, and uh, my kids are there uh, they're, and they're grown and my grandkids are there and my job transferred me to Cleveland and I haven't had a chance to go back home for over a year and I'm, you know, I got, finally got vacation and spent all, every waking moment, I'm gonna be with my grandkids and loving on them and I brought all these packages and presents for them. She goes, Let, can I show you my family? And she pulls out her phone. I think she's gonna show me a picture. But did you ever have somebody like this and they're, they're, they wanna show you every photo and video in their entire phone? <laughs> so I start doing, you know, just good listening, you know, nodding my head, right? And then after somebody, did you ever talk to somebody that talks so much, you get into a rhythm? I call it bobblehead. <laughs> and then she, she stops talking after about 20 minutes and I'm like watching all these pictures. I mean, I'm, this no is going up, isn't it? I mean, I'm getting to know her at least. And then she stops talking and I'm still bobbing and it's like this moment of awkwardness, like. And she goes, oh my gosh, I just showed you my entire family, my grandkids and everything, I don't even know your name. I said, I'm John Van Epp, and she goes, are you going home? I said, no, I'm going to St. Louis like you too, and um, I'm going to a university, and I'm teaching graduate students a program that I developed that they go out then and teach others. And she goes, oh, well, that's really interesting. Is that like a business course? And I said, no, it's actually a relationship course about dating. And she goes, oh, how interesting. What's it called? So that's ah, not really your typical academic title. It's called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. She goes, where were you when I needed you? I've been married five times. <laughs> Let me tell you about my first husband. <laughs> so 
So by the time we land, I've heard about five husbands, seen her kids, her grandkids, the spouses, everybody else. And she does what when she says goodbye, standing in the aisle? Yeah, she gives me a little hug and I, I make it crooked because I don't hug her back. <laughs> I mean, come on. Just read between the lines. Five husbands. I don't know. So here's my point. I could tell you story after story, but I'm trying to isolate just one of these five areas. And I'm trying to show you as a one way street, because these are actually two way streets. I trust you. You trust me. I depend on you. You rely on me. I know you. you right. These are two way streets. But if we just make it that she felt known, I was getting to know her and she felt known and nothing else, she felt bonded. And we could go through all of these and say the same thing. These are major universal bonds in human experience. But what I came to terms with in the, in the 1980s is that they are not independent, you know, elements or entities. They're actually parts of a whole. And so when you put them together, what you actually gain is a picture of what exactly is a relationship. A relationship is these five areas. And as you can define it, you can actually then manage it. In fact, it's hard to, to, it's hard to run or, or manage anything if you don't have clarity as to what it is. So I say definition empowers implementation. I can implement my effort now if I can define where I am. So let's use this model in a very practical way. And I'm going to apply it in four steps. And the first one is going to be about building a new relationship. So this could be like if you're hiring somebody and you're, you know, 90 day probation period in the hiring, or if you meet a new friend and you're building a new friendship, but maybe we just should talk to singles for a moment and just say, what about dating relationships? So how do we build a new dating relationship? So these principles would apply to any kind of new relationship, but let's just use dating as an example. So Step one of application is this, build new relationships within a safe zone. So when you look at this, I mean, technically, these five areas really are just invisible bonds that have no order, you know, they just happen. They are how we connect. But when you think about a new relationship and you look at it, what emerges is kind of a logical sequence of how to keep a new relationship growing safely with minimal risk. And it simply says this, don't let a level get a lot higher than any to the left. Kind of work from left to right. Let what you know about somebody set the ceiling of how you trust them. Let what you know and trust set the ceiling of how you depend on them. How you know, trust and rely on somebody help that set the ceiling of how invested you are and where you set boundaries of touch. So in a dating relationship, though, think about what happens a lot of times. You get to know somebody a little bit and everything's great and good. So your trust goes out of control. It goes way up. Does this ever happen in dating relationships? In fact, then this happens and then that tends to make it feel comfortable for this. Now, I know that doesn't happen in Minnesota, but it does in California. <laughs> I want you to notice something these things are bonding. So all of a sudden I have formed a bond where the bond of my heart is overriding the judgment of my mind. I now see some issues and I rationalize them and I minimize them and I get stuck in relationships that maybe I should be more confrontive or more addressing things. Let's just be real for a minute when you first go out on a date. I mean, even little Michael knew that from our kids, right? People are telling lies in the beginning. You know, you, you first don't meet, you know, what do you meet? Meet the Facebook representative, right? <laughs> yeah, the rock star. And it's only after a few months that all some reality shows up. <laughs> and people don't always match their representative. So we need to really figure out what to get to know. So one of the great pluses of those of you who, from high school all the way through any adult singles that goes through the small group study, you're going to learn five major areas. I actually cataloged hundreds and hundreds of research studies into five major areas that are the strongest predictors of what somebody would be like in a long-term relationship. So that here's, let's empower singles 
on what they need to get to know about somebody, to build a relationship in the safe zone while actually examining the most critical areas. And like windows can be reflective of yourself and become mirrors, these five areas are also areas that we can look in the mirror and say, hey, how am I doing? What do I need to change? How can I improve myself to be in a better position for a long-term relationship? So let me trans, uh, trans move for a minute to uh, transition as to long-term relationships. So I'm gonna move these to the top. So we'll kind of go from dating to marriage for a minute. So here's, here's, here's all of your marriages functioning at the top. You guys are all doing great. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's like what Joel said, there's John and Shirley. They've got the perfect marriage. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. <laughs> Don't talk to Shirley. So, <laughs> application step two, long-term relationship. This could be between you and your kids, your adult kids, the kids growing up, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply it specifically to a husband and wife. It's this, expect your relationships to regularly get out of balance. You say, well, wait a minute, that sounds a, little, uh, sounds a little negative, a little pessimistic. This is gonna be freeing. Believe me, this is gonna be freeing. Life is always draining these areas. All of a sudden, they're dropping down. Life comes at us fast. Remember that tagline? And it's always deflating the bond of your relationship. And it's not just sin and failure and negative things of life. It's the good stuff. You get a promotion and you're busier and now your commitment to the job goes up and your actual time together begins to drop a little bit. And all of a sudden, you're not meeting each other's needs and, and things start deflating. I mean, just give me a few shout outs. What are some, here's a married couple. I don't want sin and failure. I just want like normal stuff that just happens over the course of marriage that's gonna cause these levels to drop a little bit. Sickness, what else? Give me a couple of shots. Children. Children, yeah, there you go. So kids, so I know you guys don't like kids, but listen, <laughs> they do, don't they? They, they, they drop it. Now, let, me just, let me just relate to you as parents for a minute because my wife and I have two daughters. They're, they're grown, they're married. They have children of their own. They actually live near us in uh, Southern California. So it's really wonderful. So our grandkids, a lot of times will spend the night. So our, our oldest daughter has uh, two and sometimes they look like this if you just... Uh, there's a Roy, and then here's Effie, and oh, don't they look sweet? And, uh, you know, they're drinking from the same drink, and they're uh, sharing and just snuggling and, and loving on each other. And then other times, they look like this, uh, and then this, and then this, and this, and check out her face, right? <laughs> you know, and then this, and then um, my daughter bought this book, How to Have a New Kid by Friday, but on Thursday, it got thrown in the toilet. So I just want you to think for a minute. Here's that typical couple, they get married, you know, and everything's functioning well, it's all wonderful way up here. And uh, they have a baby. What does having a baby do to their relationship? What is gonna drop a little bit when they have a baby? Okay, I see here, the guys are like, touch, 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 touch. <laughs> the women are rely, 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 rely. <laughs> right? So. I want you to say it with me. It is normal to become imbalanced in our relationship or in my relationship. So let's just say that. Now I said this earlier, but I just want to say it again. We tend to think that relationships run themselves. I think that's how we kind of like annoyingly function. And we have terms, we call it, hey, do you have a healthy relationship? Well, what is the implication? If you don't have a healthy relationship, it must be what? If it's not functioning well, then it must be dysfunctional. If it's not a good relationship, then you automatically have a... Do you understand how we set each other up in a marriage relationship for the blame-shame game? Hey, can we talk about a relationship? Why? What's wrong? <laughs> We're just a little out of balance. What did I do now? <laughs> We're so defensive because we expect good relationships to never deflate. So if you can understand that in your marriage, if you're sitting here with your spouse or if you're with one of your kids or anybody that you're with that you have a good relationship with, but if, particularly if you're married, look at each other and say this, 
it is normal to become imbalanced in our relationship and be convincing. I used to tell couples to grab each other by your shoulder and shake them, but I don't want you to do that because somebody's going to take advantage of that one. Just say, <laughs> it is normal to become imbalanced in our relationship. So look at your spouse and say it in a convincing way. Yes. Yes. You're free. You're allowed to get out of balance. Now listen to me because this is so important. It is so normal to get out of balance. The danger is not that you get out of balance, but that you stay out of balance. Slow leaks. You got to identify your slow leaks. That's the application step number three. Because listen, here's a couple. They just had a baby, you know, and they're struggling. They're going along and several months go by and then a year goes by and this goes back up. And then what happens? They get pregnant again. They have baby number two. <laughs> By the time they get baby number three, they might as well just hang it up. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, listen, I don't care what it is. All of the good things of life, whatever it is, all the blessings of life, it creates imbalances and imbalances create leaks in your closeness, your intimacy, how you bond. And it's normal for a while. But us as couples, we don't have a plan for running our relationship. So what happens is we're running everything else. We're running our finances, our kids' schedules, uh, our jobs, our, you know, our workouts. We're running all this stuff. But our relationship, nobody taught us how to run a relationship. So all of a sudden, the slow leak goes undetected and leads to a big blowout. Because three months, it's normal. But you blink your eyes and three months turns into what? three years and if you're not careful two to three years you blink your eyes turns into 20 to 30 and now that couple is on thin ice I call this critical care relationship critical care it's where you know hey we haven't been talking deeply and that's been normal because everything's busy but all of a sudden we blink our eyes and that's been going on for years and it's a slow leak or we just haven't been like uh showing each other how much we love and affirm each other. So we've been living with kind of an emotional vacuum, you know, I'm not getting any kind of affirmation from you, but that's not a big deal because we've got a lot going on. But all of a sudden you blink your eyes and that slow leak is flattening our closeness. Slow leaks lead to big blowouts. Or all of a sudden, you know, we're not showing affection. We're not physically interacting. Our sexual relationship, it's lost. You know, we don't seem to be attracted or involved with each other. And all of a sudden, that slow leak flattens the relationship. This is why step four is so important. I want you to note it. It is truly the one key to success in every relationship. It's step four, establish a plan for managing your relationship. You got to have a plan. God's going to empower you. But your effort has to be translated into some kind of a structural plan of how to do it. We've got to have a how-to for the ought-to. So we've got to have a plan. So I'm hoping that what you learn from this model is kind of a visual GPS system. A GPS system like you singles can use and you go through the small group study for singles, you'll really get into it. You'll learn five things to get to know about yourself and another person. You'll learn how to manage trust and reliance and commitment and form all this. And so when you get involved in the single study, it will really help you to have a, a, a plan for running your relationships, whether it's friendships or romantic relationships. And for you married couples, if you get involved in the, in the couple study, you also walk away with one major takeaway. So you'll learn all of the details, which is pretty cool. So you'll start getting into the weeds of each of these five areas. But as you get into all the details, it will give you a language to sit down and do what we call have a couple check in or a huddle on a regular basis for the rest of your marriage, not just for a few weeks or a few months. But it's going to be how you're going to manage that relationship, knowing that life regularly imbalances you, whether you're 20, 60, 80, life is always impacting you. So let's have regular huddles and let's talk about where we are, where we need to bring it back up, where you see it, where I see it. And this gives us a format and a language to do that. And for all of you parents, what is really cool is your kids are going to be learning this from the five-year-olds to the middle schoolers and the high schoolers are all learning this model. So there's a parent guide 
that actually goes through each of the lessons that your kids are learning and then has great questions for you as a parent to engage that child about that lesson. So it has the elementary, the middle school and the high school lessons all right there. And as you engage with them, what our hope is, is that you learn things here on campus that you're able to take home and have this concept, these, these ideas, this really invade your relationships within the family. I believe parents should be first teachers. You know, so how often do we have our kids come out of, you know, their classes and we're like, what'd you learn? Well, we have no idea what they learned. We're all dependent on them. Oh, here's a piece of paper. Let me try to decipher what this is. I don't know. Do you ever have that experience? We wanted you to have all of the information of what they're learning so you can engage. I'll, I'll give you a real quick example. I have a co-author on another book I wrote. He's got 12 kids. Talk about an imbalanced relationship with his spouse. I don't, I don't think he knows her name anymore. He took my uh, How to Avoid Falling for a Jerk book and he's reading it to two of his high school kids and one the third one is in middle school and they read a chapter out loud and then talk about it. Man, he is a hero father because he says, my relationship doesn't run itself and your relationships don't run yourself and I'm gonna empower you with practical ways to run your relationships. God says, hey, there's a formula. Here's a provision. I will give you an empowerment and energizing of your will, of your behavior, your actions, but you must step in. You must put effort. You must dig in and mine out practical skills and a plan for intentionally running your relationship. This is how we win at our relationships, through blessings of life, through the stresses of life, even through the darkest storms of life. So let's make this biblical formula a reality in all our relationships. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be with the Westwood family. And we thank you that you give us spiritual, supernatural provision but you also have modeled how we are to step out of our entitlements and into loving and serving others and to put forth the effort to match your provision. And I pray that as they go through this series over the next couple months that they will all just kind of join in, get involved in groups, dig in and mine out of this wonderful salvation you deposited. Mine out practical ways and we pray that we will formalize, each one here will formalize a plan for managing their relationships, the ones that are most significant. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.